Again, ladies and gentlemen, it's great to have you along to our webinar today uh, where we are talking more about the pasture-fed cattle assurance system. So now I'll call upon John Condon from B Central to introduce the uh, topic more and our speakers for today. So John, it's over to you. Yes, thanks Greg and uh, good morning uh, listeners uh, around Australia. It's uh, great to have you uh, uh, with us once again to participate in one of these uh, webinars. Um, some of you may remember we, we looked at the pasture-fed cattle assurance system last year in a webinar, but there's been a lot of water under the bridge in the last 12 months in terms of where the program has gone, the momentum that's being seen behind the program. Uh, so we felt it was more than timely to revisit the topic and, and, uh, and uh, review where things are up to. So you'd remember that the PCAS uh, started uh, early 2013 as an initiative of Cattle Council of Australia. It's, a, it was, it's, it's key points are that it's a third party independently audited um, a, a, a system designed to ensure that the product is um, as, as described in terms of its uh, integrity as being pasture fed and, and carrying the sort of uh, brand connotations that that entails. So with me today I have Lisa Cotter who is the coordinator of the PCAS pro program on behalf of Cattle Council. I have uh, Jeff Tees who is uh, General Manager of Livestock with uh, Tees Australia. And uh, we'll be dividing this morning's webinar into three segments. Uh, firstly, Lisa will, uh, will, uh, will, each of these will be divided into about 15 minutes each with a short opportunity for questions uh, at the end of each of those. And then as time allows, we'll have some question time at the end for more general discussion. So uh, uh, my input will only be fairly minimal. I might uh, butt in occasionally and, and pose a question or ask uh, one of our speakers to elaborate on a point that they've made. Um, Lisa will give give two uh, presentations on the, uh, the, the basic fundamentals behind PCAS and then where the more recent developments in PCAS have gone uh, and which we'll throw open to questions and then we'll invite uh, Jeff Tees to uh, present uh, his perspective from a, a, a participant in the PCAS process uh, where, where he sees the, uh, the program being up to and where the future lies. So without further ado, I'll, I'll uh, move across and ask uh, Lisa to give her give us her opening presentation. Thank you very much, John, and thank a lot to uh, Future Beef and Beef Central for coordinating this, and of course to um, Jeff for joining us for today's discussion. Um, for all those producers that have listened to the um, beginning of what is PCAS before, I apologise, but we'd just like to go back over about what um, PCAS pasture fed cattle assurance um, system stands for and and why we've developed um, this program. So PCAS is an on-farm animal raising um, claim standard and it underpins the market integrity of three um, fundamental functions. That is naturally raised claims, grass-fed cattle and never ever for the optional modules under the HGP and no antibiotic segment. So it was identified um, many years ago through a AgForce um, council meeting that there was a rising um, interest in the grass-fed beef product and with new technologies that were coming available through MSA, the ability to ensure great eating quality from a grass-fed product for a consumer um, was a market that we'd like to tap into. Also indications were coming from um, our relationships with processors and retail segments that there's particularly a growing demand in the US and that any program that was implemented in Australia had to have a strong alignment with the US standards for our export opportunities. Um, Jeff, I'm not sure if you'd like to talk about the independence and the importance of certification to a um, labelling claim. Yeah, th thank you, Lisa. And, and look, you know, w so the first time that um, AgForce came to see us about it, we jumped straight on board and that was probably four years ago. Um, we, when they came along to see us about it, we were very excited about it. It took a long time to get the certification up, um, which was very frustrating to us. But I can assure you that we are delighted with the certification now. Um, it's the only certification, third party certi certified, grass fed only product on the market. We see a lot of other people trying to imitate it, but it is the only product out on the marketplace that is 100% grass fed and it is certified by third party auditors. So we're delighted with it and it has a lot of integrity out in the marketplace and will 
gain momentum out in the marketplace. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so as Jeff indicated, you know, we've been as cattle council engaging with a lot of um, different parts of the supply chain to make sure that the standards um, met the needs of the market and the customer as well as the producers. Um, and it is completely aligned with the international requirements, particularly with the US and their free um, on-farm animal raising claims of naturally raised, grass-fed and never ever that we believe um, presents a great opportunity for Australian producers in the export market as well as domestically with which keys can demonstrate through their product and the relationship they've developed with Woolworths. So there are four different modules to um, PCAS. Currently, um, Keys and Woolworths have taken on board the HGP free and antibiotic free um, two optional modules. And we would like to think that as the program grows, there will become um, you know, market opportunities for all four segments. But currently, the program certainly is focused on the two optional modules, HGP free and antibiotic free. If you're interested to further um, investigate the program, just pop onto the website. It's got the email, uh, the address right there, and you can run through the standards, do a trial audit, and, and of course, the next step is to arrange an on-site audit if you'd like to go through with it. But we'll run through the um, basic elements of the standards now. Oh, here's the main part that most of the farmers are very interested in hearing: is how much is this going to cost me? Um, so there's a $200 annual administration fee, um, and that is decided on per pick. So you register each pro each pick, not property, um, and then the audit is an annual on-farm audit, as Jeff mentioned, it's third party. Um, so the two certification bodies you can get quotes from for your on-farm audits, and the audits are, are ranging between five and eight hundred dollars plus travel, depending where you are. We thoroughly encourage producers to try to um, get together with their neighbours and um, through the support of some supply chain organised audits when you've got other people in your area ready so you can reduce the travel costs. So element one is all about identification and lifetime traceability. PCAS is a never ever animal raising claim. So it's not just about being grass finished, it's being grass fed for their entire life. The key um, outcome for this is that the on-farm systems have been implemented to ensure that cattle are individually identified and that they are fully traceable throughout their entire life. To prove this to an auditor, it's really important that you have some sort of written statement about how you identify eligible and ineligible animals on your property. You need to keep a record of all devices used in PCAS um, eligible animal molds and have written statements about how you manage the individual processes, for instance, when you introduce cattle onto your property, how you check, how you ensure that A, they are correct animals, they are accompanied with the correct documentation and you're checking NILS devices and all the rest. So you really need to make sure before you have an on-farm audit that you've thought about all the things the auditor is going to ask and you have statements written down for each of the instances of items that might occur. All PCAS cattle must be accompanied with a PCAS vendor declaration um, and of course all other accompanying um, ones. Greg, do we have any questions around um, identification and lifetime traceability? Uh, well, I'm unsure whether they're actually about the lifetime traceability, but we do have some questions, Lisa. Um, the first one is that um, I have a lease block as well as our owned property. Do we have to do we have to have an audit for both picks, even though they are running under exactly the same conditions? That's a really great question and, and one I get quite a lot. Um, yes, they have to be included in the audit. Um, so if you have a lease block and your own block and you are running ECAP cattle on both of them, any property or any pick that you are going to be running PCAS animals on needs to be included in your annual audit. 
because the auditor needs to be able to go out and, and have a look at the facilities um, just as they would on your own block as, as well on your lease block to make sure that what you're saying in um, your paper and your processes is matching up with what they're seeing on the farm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the time frame for applying for PCAS till approval. So is that in when you register online and pay yeah. your administration fee to getting an audit, so being able to sell oh. through to Jeffrey? Um, I'd say so, yeah. yes. So it really, it, it depends quite a lot. Um, obviously registering online, you can do that in 10 minutes, um, and then you've got to contact the certification body and see when they will be able to have an auditor on site to do your audit. Theoretically speaking, if your paperwork is completely up to scratch and the auditor is available to be there, you know, within the next couple of days, and you um, have, you know, you could be certified within a week if you didn't have any corrective actions or um, anything else you needed to close out. The time frame really is up to the producer's um, ability to be prepared uh, and obviously the availability of auditors. The other thing I'd like to say there is that um, often producers do jump the gun and want to get audited very quickly, um, but then of course you end up paying all of the travel costs, which can become quite you know, expensive as opposed to waiting until there's a few more uh, producers in your area are interested and sharing that cost. But obviously if you have cattle that you know you can get into a processing facility um, and you've done the maths and it's a good business decision, then each producer um, you know, makes that decision how they would like. Yep, good. Excellent. Okay. Just quickly a follow on from that uh, previous question about uh, owning our own property, but we also have another property and things. What about adjustment? It's the exact same principle applies. So any okay. physical location you're going to be running um, PCAS cattle, the auditor has to be able to have the opportunity to view. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Um, another question. We heard that rumentin is not allowed. Is this correct? That is correct. Okay. Good. Uh, nice and short and sweet. That's wonderful. Uh, where does PCAS sit with respect to EU and MSA accreditation? Well, PCAS is another on-farm um, program. So obviously EU is a market access program um, which um, certifies the freedom of HTP use on-farm and, and assesses the lifetime traceability of animals. MSA is an um, eating quality program that has animal handling components and PCAS and MSA fit together in that uh, when you send your animals off to the processing facility, um, they must be handled um, in guidance with the MSA guidelines and at the processing facility your premiums are paid off the back of the MSA grid so it's very important for producers to understand their MSA on farm requirements but also understand the meat science and what the processors and customers are looking for from a product. I'm not sure if Jeff you wanted to say yeah. anything there. Well, Lisa I, I had a person ring this week and I would only hope that the EU audits, the MSA audits and the PCAS audits can all be co coordinated um, together. I think that's one of the most important things our industry should be trying to, to get to save producers having to do different audits um, and also that can throw an LPA audit in as well. But they all should be coordinated so producers only have to do one audit a year, not several audits through the year. That's an excellent point you make and it's certainly something that cattle council is keenly aware of and um, looking for any ways to reduce producers' duplication of auditing. Um, obviously the EU program is currently run um, through the Department of Agriculture and they set random audits um, throughout the year so only 30% of the EU pool is audited randomly and they are given um, an audit schedule within six weeks to do those. So we are trying to have um, talks and see with LPA QA cattle care, PCAS, um, you know, the BMP up in Queensland, how we can reduce producers' um, time out from work from having to do multiple audits when they often overlap. Would, would not the problem with that, Lisa, be that um, the auditors may not be the, the, same, uh, the same people on each occasion? Obviously there's, a, obviously there's a little bit more to that than sort of just meets the eye. Sometimes there is. 
So, for instance, Ausmeet are one of the certification bodies that audit PCAS. Mm. You may have an auditor that is trained to do PCAS, EU, and LPAQA, um, but in some instances, that's correct. Maybe your EU auditor hasn't done the PCAS training yet, but they, they certainly can. Mm. There are other certification body, SDS, for instance, can't do um, EU audits. They don't have the contract with the Department of Agriculture to do that. Um, so it really, you really need to be able to talk to your auditors. If you know when your EU audit is coming up, we can certainly do the PCAS audit with that. But as I said, you know, producers don't know quite a way out when their EU audit is. But that's something for cattle councils to take on board and to try to um, improve long term. Jeff, you have a comment? I just, uh, we had a person ring this week that was getting an EU audit um, and a PCAS audit together. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's a no-brainer, but that, that's where we should be striving for. I agree. Okay, let's move on, Lisa. So element number two is that around non-confinement, so that the animals are not confined for the purposes of intensive feeding for production. So a lot of questions we often get around the not confined for the purposes of intensive feeding are around cell grazing and rotational grazing practices. And I'd just like to make sure that everyone's very well aware that they are not considered um, confined for intensive um, purposes. So they're completely um, allowed under the PCAS program. So we'll just moved on to element three, which is around that they've been lifetime pasture fed. So this is certainly an element that a lot of producers have numerous um, questions on, and that is what can we actually um, feed our animals and what's considered pasture. So there's quite an, an extensive list of eligible um, supplements, but the key um, feed that is not allowed are cereal grains. So what the program um, considers cereal grains are things like barley, rye, oats, wheat, um, and it's in any form, whether it's attached to the plant after the ripened stage, or you know, as a as a byproduct or as a separated cereal grain. One of the things that often producers um, find is that sometimes their lick blocks may contain cereal grains. Um, so unfortunately, that means those lick blocks would be um, make those animals ineligible. Whilst lip blocks are certainly um, allowed in the program, mineral supplementation is um, you know, acknowledged to be a part of good animal um, husbandry practices. Because it's a never ever lifetime claim, if we're saying it's never had cereal grains before, you can't really you know, go out and expect teas to be able to market a product and say, oh, it may have had a, you know, a mouthful at this stage in its life. So currently, that is um, where the program is sitting. When cattle are grazing uh, cereal grain forage crops, they can graze them up until the flowering stage, just before the milky dough stage. So that is called on the growth, flowering growth chart, um, Zodiac code decimal up to 60, 69. Um, and if producers are looking to graze animals on forage oats crops um, or wheat crops or barley crops, they need to be able to have quite good records and um, show the auditor, if asked during the audit, what, what stage they pulled the animals off and what stage they put them on. So again, it goes back to being able to verify to the auditor, you know, prove what you say you're doing in your management system through good record keeping. Greg, do you have any questions on that element? Uh, there's, uh, as expected, there's a um, there's a there's a, a whole heap of questions coming through. Uh, just to let all those attending uh, realise that we are recording today's uh, session, and I will be able to do some complete editing of the recording to ensure that um, Lisa's audio and John's audio and Jeff's audio will marry up nicely to all the slides in Lisa's presentation, even though we can't see them at this present point in time. So just please bear with us while we're trying to organise uh, this background IT issue. Uh, but when the recording is done, you will have everything in, in synchronisation. So yes, thank you. Uh, okay, Lisa, a uh, couple of questions. Uh, if an animal is therapeutic, is, oh, beg your pardon, I'll start again. 
if an animal has therapeutic anti antibiotic treatment for a week, can it still be regarded as antibiotic free? No. Meaning that it cannot. Okay. Yep. If it's had, if, no, any antibiotic injected or ingested for a, an ill animal, even if it's when they're a calf to, you know, a month before slaughter, even if they have, um, you know, waited for the um, holding time, under the antibiotic free module, it can be never ever treated with antibiotics. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, what about, um, one of the questions is, with regard to the auditors, how widely are they spread? Across the country, like the locations of the auditors? Um, uh, they are... Yep. Yep. That's what he's yep. About. yep. So the two certification bodies that audit the PCAS program are STS and OSMEC. Both their head offices are in Brisbane, but they have auditors throughout the country. So, um, you know, for instance, I know there's an auditor at Crookwell, um, I believe there's one at Rockhampton. They do have some regionally based and then others do have to come from the metropolitan areas. So I'd really encourage um, anyone who's looking at the PCAS program to call the certification bodies, have a chat with them about where the, the closest auditor is. And if there's one not, um, you know, extremely close by, Talk to them about what other audits they have in other in local districts coming up, and whether you can jump on board with them to reduce your travel costs. Lisa, just a quick one on that: How much evidence is there of people getting groups together for audit runs uh, rather than just doing them individually? Are people working cooperatively like that? Certainly, when the program um, first started, um, we were seeing quite a, a bit of it, and I have um, had a few instances recently where producers, neighbours of realised they're both in the PCAP program and they went and organised audits a few months out from each other. We have been able to talk with them about how we can hold one certification and bring one forward so that this year for their second um, anniversary audits we can align them. Um, so there isn't as much of it as we'd like because as um, a caller called just asked earlier, um, often producers want to get audited quite quickly once they've decided they've got cattle that they want to sell within a certain time period. Um, but we have been seeing quite a bit um, of that and we'd like to see more. And if we at PCAS Admin can support that in any way, we're always helpful to, but the certification bodies are really, really good about um, ensuring they get as many audits in when they're going out regionally as, as well. Okay. This is very much with this non-confinement, non uh, what we are looking for is a free to roam um, on the... On the um, on the certification, so our customers have asked us um, that we can get a free to roam um, on, and um, we are. But we, if, if we do something, we want to make sure that that's what it is. If we say it's free to roam, um, it's a no-brainer. That's what it is. But we do want that module um, put on the PCAS standards. I'm, just, well, I'm going to jump forward and just ask Jeff a question about the. Um, uh, the, the, the product that's now coming through the, P, the P, PCAS uh, supply chain. Uh, I've, I've personally seen it in Woolworth stores um, uh, in, um, in, in Brisbane and, uh, and it is going into their outlets all right across Australia. I mean, I've seen I feel it's up to $48 a kilo. Um, so it appears to be positioned somewhere between, um, between uh, a certified organic and Woolworths conventional offer, but Jeff, obviously only a, a small proportion of the, of the PCAS carcass is in fact going into the Woolworths um, program that's uh, recently been launched and which we've covered earlier on Beef Central. Can you give us some indication what's happening to the rest of that PCAS carcass? John, um, w when we first started it um, and, and we have Woolworths now coming on board taking um, you know, certain cuts out of it, um, the rest of the products being marketed around the world in the, in the markets around the world, um, in all different forms, in the cuts, in the trim. Um, but I must say that the feedback we're getting from the domestic product has been outstanding. Some of the people that have tried it have been raving about it, congratulating us on a free to roam, um, natural, wholesome product, um, ticks a lot of boxes for people um, in the market. But we certainly are developing this market around the world and especially in the USA. Um, a lot of products starting to head that way because, as I keep saying, it's the only natural 
grass-fed product certified by third-party order on the market. Yep. So it is going very well. It's starting to tick a lot of the boxes between um, you know, organics and that. It ticks a lot of people's boxes around the place. Yep. Do you think at this point, is the, is, is the PCAS uh, uh, um, uh, uh, attraction coming from people who previously bought organic beef or is it coming from people who bought conventional who are trading up? Where is the strength that coming from in terms of the, where the purchasing decisions are coming from? I, I think it's a bit of both, um, John. I think it's um, as people have um, better disposable incomes, they're looking for a better product out in the marketplace. and to feel good about what they're buying and what they're eating. I think it's a, it's a consumer thing that's happening all around the world as disposable incomes become greater and people want protein and higher quality protein. Um, it's a question of people wanting to um, look after the environment, want the animals looked after their whole of life um, and are prepared to pay that little bit more money for it. But the thing is it's underpinned by MSA and it's always a very, very good eating quality. Yep. Um, I think what we might do, perhaps uh, while we're trying to get this IT problem sorted out, Lisa, we might just continue with your presentation and if we can catch up with the slides, we'll, uh, we'll continue to do that. But let's just move on with, with Lisa's presentation, I think. Thanks, John. Great. Do you have, do we have any other questions around the, the lifetime pasture fed claims? Um, okay. Well, there's, there's plenty of questions, but I think what we might do is just keep on going. Sure. Jeff, did you want to make a comment before we move well, on? I was just saying we're starting to see quite a lot of um, good oats cattle start to come through the system now, so people shouldn't be afraid of cereal crops, of feeding cereal crops. Um, we're starting to see quite a lot of very nice oats cattle starting to come through the system now, um, and they'll continue to come through as long as the, the, the crop doesn't get to that um, grain stage. Um, um, so we are, um, and they're grading quite well, the, the oats cattle at present. And I think that's a, a really good point too, is that, you know, if it looks like a producer can recognise that um, the crop is about to turn to that next level, what some producers have been doing, I know around home, have just been putting more cattle on there to stop it from going ahead. Mm. So there are other ways of managing it, and that's right, some producers have been doing it quite well and haven't found it as onerous um, as it first first thing. It's a good point. So the, the next um, element is underpinned underpinned is eating quality. So um, as a lot of producers are already aware, you need to be um, registered for MSA, which is as easy as going online and um, getting that organised. And when you're sending animals off to um, the processing facility, they need to be accompanied with your MSA vendor deck, your PCAS vendor deck, LPA vendor deck and have been handled consistently with the MSA on-farm um, handling requirements. Could I just um, make a comment on that, Lisa, that um, one of the things that we are doing because of the um, overseas markets are starting to move with this product now, we are, for our October price, uh, we'll be coming out with a 410 for PCAS, but we'll be paying a 10 cent premium for everything else that people send us that are PCAS registered because we not only want the steers, we'd like their cows, um, all bubbles, we won't be taking bulls, but we'll be taking um, all their other cattle that fall outside the MSA range, we'll be paying a 10 cent premium for them from October onwards. So it's a bit of a way of rewarding people for um, their efforts as well. That's a great news story, yep. Jeff. Yep. And that's another, that brings me to another good point in that Often producers ask whether we should just get our young animals certified or whether we, if you can and you have the records for their lifetime, if you can get your whole mob certified, this is the exact reason why that's a good idea because um, the grid you know, is going to be opening up and as the US market expands, hopefully that will continue to grow. Yeah, we, we packed our first um, PCASH cows um, last week yeah. um, in the system and um, we're readily looking for manufacturing type meats going forward, so um, it's a good way of rewarding producers for being in the system. Excellent. Um, that brings us to our next optional module, um, which is the lifetime free from HGPs. Um, I guess this is pretty self-explanatory, but if there are any questions, Greg, we can certainly um, 
opaque one about HGP and PCAP? Okay. Uh, not maybe specifically, Lisa, to the HGPs, but there are plenty of questions and I'm sure I'll try my best to get through them all but unfortunately I don't think I'm going to be able to get through each and every one of them. But uh, we do have questions in relation to, if I can find this again, what about hay, what about hay fed cattle during yard weaning or drought time? Yep, no, hay is an acceptable um, supplementary feed as long as that the hay doesn't contain cereal heads that are in a ripened state. So when purchasing hay or you know, speaking with your agronomist, you really need to be confident that you're um, purchasing in feed products that do not contain any banned substances, i.e. ripened cereal grains. So again, it's before Zodoc code 69. Okay. Greg, I just, um, I just had a thought. Uh, what we're going to do, the questions that we don't have time for to address in today's uh, presentation, Lisa and I are going to work through those. We'll publish those with a response from Beef Central in a, in a report tomorrow. So if anybody has posted a question that doesn't get answered, we will provide an answer via the uh, online medium through Beef Central. Absolutely. I'd just um, like to make a, I'd just like to make a comment on HGPs. Um, you know, we as, a, as an industry are finding it harder and harder to defend HGP-free product when you have the markets like China coming online that's now a HGP-free market, um, Russia with the trembolone and the acetone uh, problem. Um, we are finding it more and more difficult to defend HGPs. I have an opinion that, you know, we have synthetics and natural um, hormones together as a HGP um, and it's becoming very, very much increasingly hard to defend trembolone and acetone um, in, in, that, in our market chain and there's more and more, we have quite a large percentage of our domestic market HGP free, uh, we have the Muslim world talking about um, a HGP free product out there, China, um, certainly with Russia comes back online it's going to be a HGP free market. So, you know, I think that our module with, uh, with PCAS being HGP free, I, I don't see any other module competing with a HGP used product coming through. But um, we're certainly um, be finding it more and more difficult in defending um, the HGP free in the marketplace. Just on that, uh, Lisa, uh, to my knowledge, none of the, uh, of the PCAS supply chains that currently are in existence are have not used the HGP free component, right? Correct. Have, and the, the antibiotic free and HGP yep. combination yep. is really where they're, they're all looking at. Yeah. Correct. Okay, let's move on. Um, well, that leads us into the next element, so lifetime free of antibiotics. So similar to the question asked previously, it's not about withholding periods, it's about lifetime. Never, ever have been treated with antibiotics. So that means by injection or ingestion. So possibly the only um, exception to that rule would be a topical pink eye antibiotic treatment um, that would be allowable under the program. But other than that, it's lifetime free. So it's really important that producers have a system in place to, um, in the event that they need to treat a sick animal, that they can identify that animal and keep records of the treatments and the individual animals that were used, those treatments were used on. Even producers that don't, I often get calls from producers that say we never use antibiotics on the plate. It's really important that you have a backup for what if situations, so a register, um, a policy in place about how you would identify ineligible animals or any um, of the elements. Greg, did you want to have a question there? We might just keep on rolling. Oh, one, quick, one quick question, um, and it's probably towards uh, Jeff. Is TEAS awarding uh, the 10% premium from October? Can you clarify? Yes, from, from, yeah, we, we, did, we did pay the cows 10 cents extra last week. Um, if you have a look at our current <laughs> grid structure, the, the PCAS grid that we've got people signed up for um, is a 10 cent um, premium above our, our current prices that we're on. 
Um, what we are a little bit mindful, we do think this market is going to move considerably um, as we get along and I do not want any people disadvantaged and they won't be disadvantaged that are in the PCAS system. If the market moves, we'll move. But we have decided with October just to, to come out with a 410 price for PCAS graded cattle and the rest of the cattle will be priced at the August price, at the October price plus 10 cents um, for the PCAS cattle so people don't get caught booking cattle now on the market rising because they do believe the market is going to, to rise um, quite substantially later part of the year. It's probably worth just pointing out at this juncture too that um, to my knowledge this uh, the, the, the notion of forward pricing on grass fed cattle is, is probably unprecedented in, 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 in Australian uh, uh, the cattle markets. So you know this is this in itself does represent a you know a unique development that we haven't previously previously seen in the cattle industry. Yeah, you're right, John. Um, absolutely, and we're more than happy to go out and forward price this product. But as I said, on a we believe the market's going to rise. I don't want to catch anyone. It's not designed to do that. It's designed to reward people for being in the system and supporting the system and supporting our customers. Okay. Let's move on, Lisa. We've still got a bit of ground to cover. Um, so we're just still rolling through what I covered before around antibody use. The next um, segment of the, the webinar is really going to look at what are the new um, changes that PCAS has seen over the last um, six months and how they um, might change, you know, or open up um, the opportunity for other producers who thought PCAS was out of their their realms um, through some changes that went through the PCAS um, system. So the first um, change was around in the element one in identification and lifetime traceability. The program removed the um, reliance on the NLIS database as being the only way of establishing lifetime traceability. What we found once producers were um, being audited on the ground is that particularly for um, breeding operations, they, their NLIS database didn't necessarily correlate with their on-farm management records. So there were producers that were being greatly disadvantaged um, because they hadn't been managing the NLIS database as they should, which is their you know, legal requirement, but they did have other um, on-farm management tools that proved lifetime traceability, but just wasn't, they hadn't been backing it up on the NLIS database. Um, another example was um, a producer that had quite a large mob of cattle brought in, um, had the, all the correct documentation and was using quite an advanced um, management system with the NLIS tags. Um, however, you know, 10 had lost their tags whilst they were out and because the producer couldn't pick up the individual um, NLIS tag that had dropped out of that individual animal and record that number down against the replacement tag they had put in. Those animals had effectively lost lifetime traceability on the NLIS database. Even though the producers had other documentation, other management records that could support the animal's um, identity. So Whilst the NLIS database still is the preferred way of achieving lifetime traceability, and um, I know the processing um, plants certainly would be preferable for everyone to be doing that, and we encourage that. There were some um, opportunities where the producers weren't managing their database that were leading to them their whole program being knocked out when it wasn't really um, fair and a lot of instances. The next one was around the requirement for NILS devices to be fitted at the time of weaning. When, again, um, you know, more audits had occurred, some producers who were breeding only operations didn't insert their NILS device until the time they leave the property, which is the legal requirement for the NLIS. Um, so they were being um, excluded from the program because they didn't insert their tags then for retention reasons and, and other management reasons. So um, it was brought to our attention that in certain instances 
where they're breeding only operations and not trading operations, that that was an acceptable um, opportunity for those producers to put forward a, an alternative to the prescribed um, rules of, of the PCAP standard. Do we have any questions um, around those changes? Uh, plenty of questions. There's no two ways about that. <clears throat> okay. Um, ooh, where do you start? Okay. Um, I've got a question here from a cattle trader. What documentation do I need with any steers I buy? So if you are a certified, um, PCAS certified property, you can only be bringing, buying in certified animals that have spent their entire lives on a certified pasture fed property, or you can be buying in wieners that have been accompanied by a non-certified supplier declaration that declares that they have been raised in accordance with the standards. Wieners, as defined under the um, PCAS standards is an animal that's under 10 months of age and that has been weaned for the purpose of its first sale. So even if an animal is under 10 months of age, it has to come from the vendor bred property. It can't have changed multiple hands. And you need to get the um, accompanying documentation signed by the um, producer who's responsible for the animal husbandry of those animals within 30 days of purchasing those stocks. The only exception to that rule is when you become first certified. So if perhaps you purchased a mob of wieners in last year and you still have contact with the vendor and you can call them and ensure that they um, were raised consistent with the standards and the vendor is happy to sign retrospectively the non-certified supplier declaration, then um, you can bring those animals into the system in your initial certification. After your initial certification, it has to be brought with the consignment of the cattle. Okay. And that's, uh, one quick question. That declaration Sorry. available on the website to download. Okay. One quick question before we move on, and this is a double uh, double question. One for you. One for a couple for Jeff. Uh, for Jeffrey, uh, where are the current markets, and are there any grids available? And for Lisa. Uh, are there signs available for gates for accredited PCAS producers? Yeah, um, there certainly, uh, Greg, we do have um, grids out there. Um, we're on 4.30 um, for the grid for August and 4.20 for the grid for September. And um, as I said, the grid for, and their proper grid with, it, with, with everything on it. Uh, but for October, it'll just be a 4.10 PCAS price with a plus 10 cents on the current grid in October um, for producers. So we're more than happy to supply grids to PCAS producers. Um, book them up or just give us booking space and they can ride the market more than comfortable with that. But it, we are sort of, we have August booked, we have September going very well for bookings. Um, we just want to make sure, and we have taken extra cattle in July, last couple of weeks, in, in I'm sorry, in June. We took, uh, we've taken some extra cattle because, and we didn't want them, but we paid for them because producers have gone to the trouble to get accredited um, and, and to give them an opportunity. But um, we're more than happy to, to go out. July is booked um, solid. In fact, we've got some overbookings in July, um, but uh, we're still, and August is just about booked too. We're looking for September and October now. Okay. And in okay. relation to PCAF signage, um, we don't have any signs um, made up, but I can certainly make the um, artwork, the logos available to producers who would like to get signage made up for, for their gate. Okay, wonderful. Okay, if we can continue, that'd be wonderful. The next major area of the standards that has changed um, of recent times is element six around lifetime free from antibiotics. After a review of the USDA standards, there had been a change around the last sentence of the outcome. So the use of emplementics for the treatment of parasites is allowable under the program. 
Now that had been quite a um, area of concern for a lot of producers and the reason it has been clarified is that because some, for instance, ivermectin contains low level um, sulfonamides and ionophores and they were being excluded under the program because of the ambiguity there. So this change um, has been obviously greatly received by a lot of producers, um, particularly in the South. The other thing I'd like to um, point out is that vaccinations are completely acceptable and they have always been, um, but that's certainly a misconception. PCAS is not an organic program. It is a naturally raised, grass-fed, no antibiotics um, program, which is quite um, different to anything else that is out there on the market. Lisa, what sort of products can, you know, are we looking at here? So any sort of drench or injection that is for like ivermectin, Dectamax, the use, the use, the control of internal parasites yep. is allowable under the program. And then five in one, you know, vaccines, they're all um, allowable under the program as well. Yep. Any questions on that element? Uh, yeah, plenty of questions. Um, in regard to maybe not antibiotics, Lisa, but um, estrogen is the main ingredient of HGPs, females two to ten, two to eight teeth, all have natural estrogens. Are open females not spayed con considered HGP free? They're, they're considered HGP free as long as they haven't been administered a HGP um, um, inje um, injection. So I are free. Okay. Um, say again. Yes, natural. The distinction being naturally occurring each estrogen versus um, enhanced estrogen through an ICP. Correct. 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 Okay, uh, Jeff. One for you. Do pasture-fed cattle beat EU prices? Um. At present, they have been. Um, yes, they have been. We have, interesting, probably, we believe, our database at present, probably 65% of our cattle are EU accredited people that are PCAS registered. Um, and we are, they have been getting, enjoying large premiums with PCAS um, in the last uh, little while. Um, and that will, I could see that they could level, but at this stage there has been a good premium for PCAS over EU. Mm -hmm. uh, quickly, uh, what about, you know, uh, loose licks with copper based, uh, those sorts of things? Copper is, a, is, is allowed under the program, so any sort of loose lick that contains a cereal grain would be banned or any sort of ionophore or remensin. But if it's a loose lick that is made up of um, mineral supplementation and is on a base of um, an approved supplement, which is available in the standards, the full list, and copper is certainly one of those, um, would be completely allowable under the program. What about leukina and palm kernel? Leukina is, is fine, yep. It's a, you know, a natural vegetation um, that's allowable under the program. It's not a cereal grain and the same with the palm kernel as um, a roughage product. Okay. Uh, can you explain the criteria for purchase cattle eligibility for PCAS? Um, yes. So if a producer is purchasing cattle um, from outside their home bred mob, they need to come from a certified pasture-fed property and be accompanied with a certified pasture-fed de vendor declaration. The only exception to that rule, as I um, touched on before, is weaners that are under 10 months of age accompanied by the non-certified supplier declaration. You can only buy in cattle from a certified property or weaners under 10 months of age that are accompanied with the correct documentation currently. Okay. In, re in regard to free to roam, how, how does weaning impact this? So the standards allow for 20 days of confinement for husbandry purposes. 
and yard weaning, um, obviously common practice, is allowable under the program as long as the animals are not confined for more than 20 days in a calendar year. And obviously when, whilst they're being um, yard weaned, that they're being fed items from the eligible supplements list and that all of these um, processes are being recorded and what you're feeding the animals is being recorded. So when the auditor comes on site, he can have a look at um, what you're doing and make sure that you're in line with the standards. Okay. Is there any chance six or eight tooth steers being accepted? If not, why? Yes. Um, well, as I've said, from October onwards, we will be paying a 10 cent premium for them. Okay. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, where are we? What about uh, sort of going back to some lick ingredients like urea, phosphorus, those sorts of things? Yep, so again, unless it's a cereal grain or is um, some form of antibiotic, they are allowable under the program. Okay. Greg, can I just go back to clarify on that six to eight tooth question, uh, the one previous. We should have pointed yes. out, of course, that um, one of PCAS's um, fundamental um, uh, entry points is the MSA program. So. Um, uh, you know, people need to keep in mind that while Jeff does plan to offer a premium on those uh, cows and what have you going forward, that um, cattle still need to be eligible for MSA to, to qualify under the full PCAS program. Okay. Thanks, John. Uh, what about, um, is the PCAS, is PCAS breed, breed specific in any way? No, not, not in any way. Um, all breeds are acceptable. Um, there, there is no breed specific at all. Okay. It's a meat quality. Okay. Uh, if you purchase cows and calves that are not certified, would the calves be eligible? Yes, if they are under 10 months of age and you could um, get that non-certified supplier declaration from the vendor. Okay, uh, just a quick one, very quick, whole cotton seed. I'm sure that's that would be um, okay? Cotton seed is an um, excellent alternative feed substance that is allowable under PCAP. Okay, um, a tricky question, but very important uh, for future markets in the Chinese import market. Um, with regard to uh, getting an answer for the Chinese tests and finding any readings for estrogen, uh, is it a natural oil or a synthetic estrogen? I don't believe there's any. Um, that's one of the problems that we have um, with, um, you know, I have an opinion that we can defend natural hormones, but we're having troubles defending synthetic hormones. As I've said, the HGP issue, um, when we have um, very high readings on heifers with estrogen um, in the system, um, naturally, um, I think that our industry can defend natural hormones, but I find it very, we can't seem to defend these synthetic hormones. And they're both lumped together. If you hit, a, if you in, hit an animal with a HGP, um, we can't distinguish whether it's a synthetic or a natural under the under the, under our under our paper certifications, and uh, we find it very difficult to to defend the synthetics. Okay, um, Greg, I think, I think we just looking at the time, Greg. We are pushing up against yeah. our one-hour window, so we should, we should try to wind up. I'm going to just ask um, okay. uh, Jeff and Lisa just to provide some a couple of brief concluding remarks and then I think we might uh, might wind it up. So that's, Jeff, that's is there fine. anything else you'd just like to add before we finish up? Well, well yes, thanks John. I'd just like to sort of thank all the people um, that have got behind us with PCAST. Um, it has been a journey. I really do, do believe that we have to distinguish our product. Um, if people, we, we are very mindful at Tees Australia that people have been through a very, very tough patch with prices of cattle. Um, we do believe that one of our biggest concerns is 
that our valuable customers out, out there um, you know, haven't been getting enough money for their product. These sort of programs you know, are going to help the returns for people out there. The more um, of these special markets that we can get out there and market our meat around the world, we naturally have the, the cleanest, greenest product, natural product out there in the world and we should be putting certification around it and, and extracting big premiums in the marketplace around the world for it. And that's what this is about and has been about it from day one. We have to start somewhere. We're moving along. We have some great partners um, that have come along the journey with us, um, both in the cattle producers and also our customers that are taking the product and we're building on it brick by brick and we continue to build on it. So I thank the people that um, have been with us um, and the people that are coming on. I'm getting a lot of inquiries about it, um, especially the HGP issue. Um, if people you know, are going that way, they should be going EU and PCAS um, and got two markets that are the best markets we've got out there in the marketplace. So um, I, I just hope that people realise how easy it is um, to, to get on board and to extract the premium and hopefully it grows the way we see it's going to grow. I'm sure it is. Okay, thanks. Uh, Lisa, have some closing remarks? Look, just like to thank the organisers for today. It's been a wonderful experience, and particularly to Jeff and the team for coming on board with Cattle Council um, and supporting the certified program and supporting a certification that's returning um, premiums to producers in a time where there hasn't been a, a lot of that. So. You know, we would love to see more people come on board and if there's anything we can do with PCAS to help support producers to become audit ready, please contact us. We'd love to help. Um, and just go on the website, read through the standards and see if it suits your programs and, and contact your local buyers to see you know, how it's going to fit with your operation. Thanks, Lisa. <clears throat> well, that draws us to a close. I'd just like to point out that um, the uh, uh, this webinar process is working very well. I mean, despite the little uh, the glitch we did have halfway through today's program, we've had uh, about 350 uh, subscribers participate in today's um, webinar. And if you add that on top of the 600 plus subscribers that we got uh, when we did this webinar a year ago, there's now been over 1,000 producers Australia-wide who have now um, participated in this process, uh, scrutinising the, the, the PCAST uh, opportunity via, via the web. So I think that's a great success and thank you to all involved. Uh, to you, Greg, thank you for coordinating this for us and bringing it all together and, um, and uh, we wish you all, all, all well. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, John. Uh, thanks to you, Jeff and Lisa, um, for making yourself available and uh, giving us an insight <coughs> pardon me, into the uh, PCAS um, system. Uh, also, just before we go, uh, just uh, don't forget that um, uh, all the daily emails that are coming out of Beast Central, um, if you haven't signed up yet, pop on over to Beast Central and sign up. Also, don't forget to go to the Future Beep website uh, for all your information um, for the beep industry across Northern Australia. And in due course, the recording of this webinar will be up on to the um, media area of that website. Uh, we will also be sending out a follow-up email with the link to the recording along with a quick survey because we always like to uh, get your feedback. Um, so uh, folks, uh, that's all for today. Uh, I'd again like to thank all the speakers for coming along and giving us their time and insights and a big thank you to everyone for attending and coming along and interacting with us today. So uh, all the best and until we connect again, it's Haru for now.